My name is Janelle. I'm a 21-year-old French girl and a student in France. Tired of not finding true love, I decided to lose my virginity with my best friend. In them, I found a pretty fantastic sex friend with whom I got along wonderfully on all levels. For about three months. That was around the time they threw me aside because I'm still in love with my ex. I was so fragile at the time that I made my first suicide attempt. I went to the emergency room and then the mental hospital. For the smart amongst you out there, you'll probably have guessed that I was already in a depression for a few months after. Under treatments as well, with a strong penchant for alcohol on the side. To complete this auto-destruction mechanism, what better than reaching out on some dating apps? A few weeks after my release from the mental hospital, I matched up to make some new encounters and forget about my dear and ex-best friend. I always met guys at home for a first date because I have zero experience with this kind of thing, and that's what I did for all of my normal dates. On one fine day, it came a time when I matched with a guy who we'll call Matthew. Matthew was not the most beautiful and had more than a few extra pounds, but I'm not exactly Beyonce myself, so hey, why judge? I matched since we had similar tastes, especially his hobbies and the fact he liked to smoke weed. So I thought to myself, hey, perfect, why not smoke some joints between having sex and doing our hobbies? He gave me some personal information like his address, his job, things going on in his life. He told me he'd just recently gotten fired. Work or no work though, I didn't really care. I simply explained to him that I was in quite a fragile state and I'd just come out of a mental clinic being very depressed. All for the purpose of making him understand that I might not be at my best. I also told him I was not looking for something very complicated. He assured me that was exactly what he was looking for as well, and he actually preferred to just be very cuddly. Perfect. After only one or two days of discussion, we agreed to set a date, a mojito party at my house, and he'd bring along some joints. When he arrived, he was even worse than in his photos. He was completely dirty and had extremely greasy hair and was wearing a stained t-shirt as well, the style of a teenager living with their mom despite being at least 26 years old. I was far from wetting my panties, but I desperately needed some company. I offered to make him some drinks while I chose a film on television. Instead, though, he ran into the kitchen to prepare two mojitos before joining me on the sofa. We talked a bit, and he was not really that smart or interesting either. I downed my drink, hoping to animate the party with that alone. After that... It was a three-day blackout. According to our dear Matthew, I had that drink that we smoked while watching a film before going into the bedroom. I can vaguely remember being on the bed and seeing him dressed above me, looking at me before turning his heels and slamming the door. I remember my phone going off constantly. I was away from a work group appointment at the time, so my friends were worried and kept on calling me. They couldn't contact me the entire time so they contacted my sister. None of them could get through. Eventually, they got so worried they rushed to my house and rang again and again. Still no answer, so they called the fireman who managed to open the bottom door, but not the door to my apartment. They kept on knocking, calling me, and eventually I ended up opening the door. The fireman concluded I was hungover and left while my friends helped me get dressed. They also thought I drank too much. They noticed, though, that my body was now covered with yellow betadine marks on my arms, legs, stomach, etc. They took my cat and took me back to one of their houses since I was in an almost comatose state. I was having trouble speaking. I looked almost completely elsewhere. I seemed to have a lot of trouble conceptualizing as well. The next day, my sister came to pick me up so I could stay with her for a few days. Everyone was convinced I'd just tried to kill myself with drugs and alcohol. At about that time, though, I started having a pain in my private area and a lot of blood loss as well. My sister took me to the hospital. I explained to them that I had to report I may have had unprotected sex while unconscious. I was advised to file a complaint, and I was redirected to the OB emergency. 
The next day, I finally snapped back to fully awake. My relatives could see it right away. I was much more lively, my remarks were more consistent. I got swabs done and a bunch of tests as well. Over the course of a week, I made a series of appointments for blood samples, urine samples, etc. I went on to file a complaint with the testimony of my friends, who met me at home, and my sister who took care of me the entire time. After talking about it to people my age, older people, but especially medical staff and the police, the term organ trafficking was mentioned more than once. Apparently that guy Matthew was suspected of it. They think he must have chickened out because he actually liked me at the last minute or something. Despite my complaint, my bed full of betadine, my underwear torn off, and the blood on the doors of my apartment, which I'm not even sure how that got there, my attacker got nothing, and I'll never know what really happened during those three days. I'd like to point out that I did used to drink and smoke in addition to my treatment, and never before had I blacked out for an entire three days. I'm absolutely sure he put something in my drink. So this happened on Saturday. I, 29 and female, live in a fairly decent neighborhood. Not exactly the best, but definitely not one usually thought of as super dangerous either. Actually, it wasn't even that late at night. It was only like 9.30 p.m., and it was summer as well. It had only been dark for at most an hour or so. I had left my friend, taking transport back home. And, since my friend had left in a rush, there was something I wanted to do that I felt I might forget once I'd actually arrived home. Someone had tried to take my phone out of my hands a few months ago though, so I was waiting until I was in a safer place to take it out. I turned a corner, and there was literally one more block to my house. It was a pretty narrow street. This seemed to be as safe a place as any. I started to pull my phone out when suddenly someone stumbled toward me. His words were quite slurred, so I didn't quite get what he said at first. It was dark as well. After a moment, I understood he seemed to be telling me to give him my phone or my wallet or something. I stared, and despite the darkness, I could see something in his hand. It looked very much like a gun. It may have been fake, but still, I was terrified. For some reason, I looked around. Not so far away, walking toward me, was another woman. I screamed for help and ran away from the man, all while bracing myself for the pain just in case the gun was not fake. The woman yelled at me to stop running and come inside the building closest to us, and she ushered me in. There, after having a bit of a panic attack, the woman told me there had been another man hiding behind a car nearby that I didn't see because I was so fixated on the other guy's possible gun. I don't know exactly what that was about other than grabbing my phone, but still, there's a possibility I may have lost more than just my cell phone if I decided to stick around. I've been debating about whether to share this or not, but I finally decided it's been long enough for me to talk about this. This happened to me and my mom a few months ago, back in October. It happened in a very rural part of New Hampshire, like a side road on a side road type of neighborhood. It was pouring out, as it had been raining for pretty much the entirety of the day. My mom had just gotten back from down the street in my sister's car. I was on the couch in the living room, when I suddenly heard the doorbell ring. Our front door has a big glass pane on the front, so we could look out from the inside, and I guess people could look in from the outside as well. Through the window pane, I could see a man. I didn't really get a great look at him, as I didn't have my long distance glasses on. The man, though, seemed to have noticed I'd seen him, and waved as if trying to be friendly. For the rest of this post, I'll refer to him as the Poncho Man. I got up and thought about opening the door to see what the man wanted, but I relented. I couldn't properly see who this was, and I didn't want to let a stranger into the house. Instead, I went down the hall to my parents' bedroom, where my mom was getting ready for work. She asked what was up, and I explained to her that a man in a poncho was waiting outside our door and seemed to want to talk to us. Instantly, she went as white as a ghost. Immediately, she stopped getting ready 
closed and locked the bedroom door, and started checking the windows to make sure they were locked. I asked her what the hell was going on. My mom explained to me that as she was driving home earlier, she had actually seen the poncho man. He had just been standing there motionless in the rain, on the side of the main street. As soon as my mom turned down our road though, she saw him start to walk in the mirror, presumably to follow us. At the time, the encounter was weird, but she hadn't thought anything more of it. Why would someone be standing out there in the pouring rain on this random back road in the afternoon? It was like he was waiting for something. I started to panic as well. My mom called my aunt and asked what she should do. My aunt told her to call the police immediately, and so we did. We proceeded to pace around the bedroom, frantically looking out the windows to see if we could find the poncho man. From where the bedroom was angled though, it was impossible to look at the front porch and see if he was still there. After what felt like hours, we finally saw a police car pull up. We carefully unlocked the door and went down to let the officer in. We explained what we'd seen and he agreed to do a scan around the neighborhood. As he left though, I noticed there was something left on the doorknob. I took it off. It seemed to be a political ad for a candidate running for office. At first, I thought it was possible the poncho man was just campaigning for said candidate, but then I found a lot of holes in that story. It was pouring out now, so why would he go door to door in that weather? And why would he take such an obscure route in such an off-the-beaten-path neighborhood? The houses were very far apart, so you'd barely make a dent campaigning in this area. The timing didn't make sense either. Sure, me and my mom were home, but it was four in the afternoon most people would still be at work. Eventually, the officer returned. He found the guy down the road and questioned him. The man claimed to ID himself and claimed he was a political campaigner and was just knocking on doors for that reason. When probed further though, conveniently enough, the man claimed he'd left the last ads at our house. That makes the campaign story even more absurd. Our house was right in the middle of the street. It's not like we were the last on the block so why would you go down that street if you hadn't brought enough for the whole thing? Even the officer pointed this out to the man and said it was unusual behavior. The man fled soon after. Although the officer was suspicious of him, there wasn't really anything he could do about it. There was no way to prove the man's intent. He told us to be very alert and not hesitate to call if the poncho man returned. Fast forward a few weeks. I started noticing the officer's car seemed to be permanently stationed just down the road from us. I got curious and asked my mom about it. She said there had been multiple break-ins into the houses down the road, and now the officer was doing a sort of sting operation. The poncho man encounter and the break-ins may be unrelated, but considering how the man acted, I have a sinking feeling they're connected. Thankfully, for the past few months, we've seen neither hide nor hair of the poncho man. We got a new doorbell system with a camera, and the police left the area where they were doing the sting. I hope that means this whole situation is over, and we're done with and never have to meet that man again. I'd like to share my little story. My childhood best friend Marie and I were around 12 or 11 years old at the time. Marie's family had their own campsite in a provincial park, about two hours from our hometown. We would spend the entire summer each year living in their camper out there. This particular summer, I was able to go and stay with them for a week, and we were excited to spend our time adventuring around the forest. On the last night I was there, we decided we wanted to hurry down to the ice cream shop by the lake before it closed. It was early evening at this point, still pretty bright out, but just beginning to lose the light. The path we took was down a short slope right next to the main road, with about 10 feet of thick brush and trees in between. On the other side was the forest, with more tall, thick brush as well. We were walking along, not seeing a single other person on the path in front of or behind us. All of a sudden, though, we heard a sudden rustling and snapping of branches similar to the sound of a deer moving through the woods. I wouldn't have thought anything of it, but then the sound of running footsteps soon followed. Marie glanced back and suddenly grabbed my arm, urging me under her breath not to look. At the same time, the running stopped. I don't know why I didn't ignore her and get a look myself. 
I guess I could sense the very real fear in her voice and chose to simply listen to my friend. We both started to panic, getting that feeling like when you're running up the stairs after turning the basement lights off. We picked up the speed as much as we could without breaking into a sprint, knowing the ice cream shop was only a minute walk away at this point. The path soon broke, and we arrived in the parking lot. Suddenly, Marie steered me hard to the left, heading towards the lake and the boat rental area. Instead of continuing straight to the ice cream shop, I went along with it silently, understanding ice cream was no longer the supreme interest right now. Marie was clearly panicking. We were both looking around, but it seemed whatever had scared her was nowhere to be seen at this point. Marie walked up to the boat rental and got us a kayak. We climbed in and paddled out into the middle of the lake. As we paddled there, she told me there had been a man behind us. The man had stopped running at us very abruptly upon making eye contact with her. He had been wearing a long black coat, with the hood pulled over his face, despite it being the middle of July. She'd seen a terrible smirk upon his face, and swore that as he stopped running, she saw him put away something shiny into his coat pocket. He appeared to have just emerged out of the bushes immediately after we walked past them, given the sounds we heard right before he came running onto the path. We reached the center of the lake and stopped paddling. I pulled out my Nokia brick phone that my parents had thanked God given me just in case. I handed it to Marie and told her to call her parents to come pick us up. As the phone began to ring, I saw her look out past me into the shore. She went pale, lifting a hand to point shakily at what she was seeing. I turned. There was the man, stalking his way around the path that circled the edge of the lake, staring out at us, and watched him do two full laps around, never looking away from us. He waved before stepping back and disappearing into the woods. It took a few tries to get a hold of her family. We were freaking out so bad the whole time. As the sun got lower and lower, we did manage to have someone come with a truck. By the time we reached the shore, it was pretty dark outside. I don't really know what we would have done if I hadn't been able to call for a ride with my phone. Looking back, I don't know why we didn't just go to the ice cream shop, inform an adult there, and ask her parents to come get us then. But still, it worked out. We got back safe, and we thankfully never saw the man again. I was a utility locator, and I used to work on a team with my dad. To find a gas service from the gas main to the house, you must connect the equipment at the gas meter. Many older homes have the gas meter located in the basement. Sometimes, I would be the one to connect the equipment, while my dad went out to find the gas service. On this particular day, we got to a house that had the meter stationed in the basement. I go up, Knock on the door, the homeowner points me in the direction of the stairs to the basement. I go down and I can see the gas meter in the corner, with two walls built around it, sort of making it like a closet with no door. Behind the gas meter was an old crawl space halfway up the cinder block wall, no lights at all in that space. As I stepped into this small closeted area, I heard what I could only describe as a demonic growl coming from behind the crawl space. I stepped out immediately and called my dad for backup. Not wanting to sound spooked myself, I only told him I needed a flashlight. He hung up and I stood outside the doorway and reached in to hook up the equipment. My dad came down the stairs with a flashlight. As he stepped through the door to see if I'd got it in the dark, that same demonic growl came from the crawl space. He just about knocked me down the stairs rushing to get back out of there. He handed me the flashlight and ran back outside. I stood there pointing it at the crawl space with a feeling that something was watching me. My dad called me and told me he was done working on this house now. I grabbed my equipment as quickly as possible and ran the fuck out of there. I never did find out what it was. I know for sure it didn't sound like a dog or a raccoon though, and I've never heard anything like that before or since. I had a veteran female marine in my anatomy class that was having some problems with what she assumed was a stalker. She had a guy from a town about 40 minutes away come to set up a computer for her and debug it. 
The guy was bragging about how he was all ex-military intelligence, blah, blah, blah. She thought nothing of it at first. He got her computer set up and everything seemed to be fine. Mind you, she's a fairly attractive single woman and mother of four. Her house was huge and had a pretty good alarm system installed, including the motion sensor camera. The alarm system also gave her updated lists of which doors had been opened and at what time. She was home alone one morning, getting ready for class, when she heard what she thought was a door slamming. She grabbed one of her firearms and loaded it, and checked the house only to find nothing. She left and set the alarm, and didn't think much of it. Must be just going nuts from stress or something. She left the house, and then immediately got a notification on her phone that after she left, the alarm was deactivated, and the front door had been opened and closed. She realized she had not just been hearing things. She called the police and the alarm company, but after they came and searched the house, they found nothing. Fast forward a week later, alarm was still acting up. The cops had been called a second time, and her neighbor helped her search the house as well. She asked me while in class to come home with her and search her house with a gun. I agreed. On the way there, the alarm was still being weird. We arrived to the house and loaded our firearms. We started downstairs and worked our way slowly up. As we arrived to the top floor, I asked her if she'd ever checked the attic. She was surprised and said no. My adrenaline started pumping immediately as we found the crawl space door up there. I climbed in first, not knowing what or who I'd find. We looked around with our flashlights and we could see a set of footprints in the billowing insulation leading to a far corner with a blind spot. We walked over cautiously to check. No one was there. We climbed down from the attic and shut the door. She recognized that sound as the sound she'd heard that first morning when she was home alone. We went downstairs to chill out and wait for her kids to get home when I noticed the doggy door on her back door. I asked her if she locked it. I inspected it, only to find that this lock could be unlocked very easily simply by sliding any key across the latch. The man had been entering and exiting her home through the dog door. We left immediately to go buy a new door and come back to install it. After leaving, she got an update that the doors from the garage into the house and out the back door had all been triggered in the meantime. They had been hiding in the garage the entire time while we were in the home. We installed a new door, and the problem ceased soon after. Scary shit. 